Hello. Thank you for that warm introduction there, Igor. I want to thank the uh, Dow Denver team. This has been an amazing conference. Love the venue. Never uh, opened up for Dead Mouse before. This is going to be a, a fun panel to, to end the day. My name is Jason Fishman. I'm the host of the Test, Optimize, and Scale podcast. I run an investor and user acquisition marketing agency out of LA. I've worked on over 300 fundraising uh, campaigns and, and focus on audience building. Thought we'd start with intros, let you know who you're hearing from, why we're all on this panel here today. And we're going to be talking about the power of audience, crowdfunding, leveraging these users towards different milestones. Uh, but if you want to kick things off here. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, so I'm the chief product officer at Tassin. Um, we're the team that launched uh, the TXA token. So that was 20 million raised. Um, and now we're here. And I think a lot of you, I recognize you from my talk. Uh, we're helping token projects launch, uh, whether that's DAOs, utility tokens, or NFTs. Excellent. Excellent. Hey, everybody. I'm Dave Rodman. I'm the managing partner at the Rodman Law Group. We're located right here in Denver. Uh, I have been practicing in the blockchain crypto space since late 2016, weathered the whole crypto winter uh, and, and watched as our firm kind of pivoted from cannabis to crypto. We are now by practice area. The, our biggest practice area is crypto and everything within the blockchain space. Uh, so what I do is I try to keep my clients from violating laws and stay out of prison. The fun stuff. Fun stuff. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Dalton Wright. I'm a partner with Kickstart Fund, uh, active seed investor based out of Utah, but we're one of the most active investors in Colorado as well. So currently investing out of a $110 million fund five. And we've made a number of investments over the past few years in I'd say Web3 adjacent technologies. And uh, this is the first time really where we have now uh, the full blessing of our investors to start investing in cryptocurrencies and holding tokens. So it's kind of a new, a new age for us as a firm. Um, and I've also uh, been dabbling in student-led investment funds for a number of years, and so I've helped establish community-led investment vehicles. And so I'm very interested in how DAOs can be the next evolution of our community investment strategy that we've pioneered. So uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. I want to talk about strategy and preparation, but to start... Why crowdfunding? Why crowd sales? And this comes in many formats. We were talking about regulated crowdfunding and different types of filing there, various types of crowd sales, uh, the, the crowd funds that are happening for DAOs right now. Why, why rally up a high volume of individuals versus go after a few larger VCs? Or there's other methods, airdrops, a few other things. Why, why should founders in the audience be paying attention to crowdfunding? I, I guess I'll take that one. So um, we did a raise uh, April of last year. We started traditional, right? We're, we're a software company that's building in the decentralized finance space. We went after like regular VCs and actually got a couple to sign on and then realized um, there was a lot of interest from um, crypto VCs. So once we started like putting a community together, getting a telegram together, uh, going out and seeing like who in the crypto space wants to be a part of a project that meets you know, our mission, um, it just started to snowball, getting big investors in first, really showing that this thing has legs, and then going after, uh, I mean, we call them small check investors, but it's community members that believed in the purpose who might not be actual investors, but people who want to put some money in to be a part of, a part of this. It, so it, we kind of backed into crowdfunding our project, um, but we raised... 15 times more money than we thought we needed to like do the first proof of concept. So it was wildly successful for us. And yeah, we're happy that other people want to go, go down this road. Yeah, I'd, I'd answer that more from you. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I would answer that from the perspective of an investor, um, why we're interested in some of the signal that we can get from a community, so a crowdsourcing investment decisions. So um, a couple of years ago, we made this experiment. I went to my investors and I said, hey, I, I have a really great idea. I want to take some of your money that you've given to us and I want to give it to unproven students, unproven VCs, and ask them to invest it in other students. So, you know, great idea, right? You know, we're going to invest in unproven VCs, invest in unproven founders. You know, what could go wrong, right? And what, what we actually did, we, we proved that there's a lot that can go right here. So I got a lot of pushback from our LPs in the early days. They just said, that seems like a charity, really, what you're doing. You're, I get that you're all about educating the next generation. We support that. But as an investment strategy, why would we do this? 
And what we found was that the students have a lot better perspective of some of the newer trends than we have as kind of, you know, eventually becoming dinosaur VCs. And we were able to empower students to identify the best students on campus. That strategy has resulted in us in identifying companies. One, one company is on, on track to be a billion dollar company this year. And these are student-led startups found by other students that we would have never discovered had it not been for students being empowered to go out there and look for great investment opportunities. So I have this belief that we're about to see some disruption of the pre-seed uh, stage by DAOs because I believe that it's very hard to actually scale a pre-seed investment strategy because you're writing small checks. We would have never been able to spend, it, we could have never justified spending hundreds of hours on campus in interviewing and meeting with a lot of student entrepreneurs to, to ultimately write a $20,000 check. There's no reason why we could have done that. But when you actually atomize some of the decision making and the sourcing, give it back to a community that you've empowered and that you trust, they do have the leverage and the, and the bandwidth to actually go out, identify those opportunities. So I think the smaller the checks that you're writing uh, and the more that you have actually have to sort through in order to get the signal on an investment decision, the more it's actually opened up and, and enabled by a community. We saw that with Campus Founders Fund, the student run venture fund that I mentioned. And we're going to double down on that strategy because we've, we've already seen that they're making decisions that we would not have made that were the right decisions. There were investment decisions that they made where they came to me and they said, Hey, you know, here, here's this idea that we were told. I, and in my pattern recognition, I said, here's why I don't think it'll work. They said, that's great, Mr. VC. We're going to go ahead and make the investment anyway. And I said, great, that's what we want you to do. And that in particular investment decision that I'm referencing is, you know, valued at $700 million now. And they invested it at $2 million pre or whatever. So uh, that's why I actually think that when I, I'm not, so I'm not focused so much on why an entrepreneur needs to raise from a bunch of investors. I'm interested in how funds like ours can, can empower communities and reward, provide rewards to that community that also serves our purposes of a fi finding great investment opportunities. I mean, just to build on that, I think that the, the venture DAO, if done correctly, really will disrupt the funding, like hands down, massive caveat if done correctly. Because what we're talking about here is securities laws and securities laws will put you in jail. I have had clients go to jail for the unregistered sale of securities. We didn't represent them when they did those things. We told them not to. Uh, but like that's the angle that I come at this from is like, let's keep people out of jail. Let's keep people from incurring massive fines. So like in that venture seed kind of realm, if you do an investment club correctly, you kind of follow the Lao, Meta Cartel, the Dow, uh, that model is powerful. They, they manage billions of dollars under what is essentially a 99 person LLC. There's, there's power there. Um, so that's, that's, that's my take on that. Absolutely. We definitely want to keep people out of jail. Dalton, thanks for that case study. That, that, those are amazing insights. I actually know some market makers that came out of investment clubs in school, and it's amazing the intel you get there. I love how you emphasize the word community as well, too. That's been the, the commonality I've seen in the most successful projects is that ability to really rally up the audience, the social sharing. I, I run a marketing agency. Ultimate marketing is peer-to-peer. -peer. So being able to have that stimulated from within the community, understanding by the polls, hey, th this is going somewhere. It really says things in a loud way. Uh, and again, want to speak to the, the teams in the audience that are looking to, uh, to go down this road. What is required to launch a campaign like this? Tokens that you speak with, legal structuring, uh, you know, while you're on campus, what does the strategy look like? I, I like to say it all comes from the plan. Uh, yeah, I, I can go first on that. Um, <clears throat> I think it, for, first is identifying the outcomes that you want to have come from your project. Um, it, like I mentioned before with the Web3 token launch playbook, like there is no one linear path for how to like launch a crypto token uh, as a vehicle to raise funds, right? So it, it comes down to understanding what do you want the token to do? What do you want the capital to do? And uh, who do you want purchasers? Where do you want to issue? I mean, just like coming with an idea of the type of business you want to run to someone like Tassin who helps launch tokens, someone who consults on the, on the legal side, just having an understanding of, of the parameters by which you can work within really helps solidify the strategy to launch a token, build that community around it, and get something launched and eventually listed on an exchange. Excellent. What about the legal side? And I imagine there's misconceptions at times about 
as you said, what's above water, what's not. How do they even go about picking the right vehicle and setting themselves up legally? Yeah, great question. Uh, I think the number one thing that I combat in my like day to day is the sort of tech view of move fast and break stuff. And like that is fine if you're iterating on software. But at the end of the day, if the underlying is financial in nature, there are three really important laws that you have to follow. The, the Securities Act of 1933, the Exchange Act of 1934, and the Investment Companies Act of 1940. That one is the scary one. And that's what a lot of these projects don't realize. So managing that and being like, OK, yeah, I, I know you think you can just iterate and break stuff, but you're going to go to jail if you do that. And I know I've said that a bunch of times now, which is kind of downer and weird, but like, uh, I'm, I'm serious about it. So we have like a, a, a very, for the space, I think, tried and true model is we, we use a, a very specific entity in the Cayman Islands, that then owns another entity in the Cayman Islands, that then owns an entity in the BBI that issues tokens. And if you do that, you have this incredible wide, uh, like blank canvas to paint on. And you can, you can legally make that top entity required to follow the vote with some guide rails of the token holder. So you can create like a synthetic company that actually works and, and can hold property and can be sued and be sued and insulates people from liability. It, it is a, and it's an expensive process. It's not a cheap thing. It's not like going to Wyoming and spending a hundred bucks and creating an LLC, but, or here for that matter, uh, it, 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 it costs much more than that, but it buys you the peace of mind at night and allows you to have some flexibility to raise in a way that you want to raise. Are we getting yanked off the stage now? Looks like it. Should we call it there then? I think we're we're up against it. I mean, I we we could share more, but I think the.